his eyes in curtain rods by Robert Long. One day, that is all it is. It has its fragments, a series of actions and succeeding actions, as mechanical as the turning of a clock. It has its existence as a whole and inescapable. <coughs> He will be held within it forever. And so will they. In the morning, he leaves his wife. But she rolls over and says something in slurred Russian. Sleepy Russian. He ignores her and quickly gets dressed. The room is not his, and it would not be right to say he is leaving home. She wakes, and they speak a little. Early morning talk. Not in English. She cannot speak it. This country is not her home, and nor, in truth, is it his. They cannot even live in it together. He knows from what she said last night that she does not want him back when she cannot see places. When she cannot see, he places his wedding ring in a china teacup on the bureau by her bed and leaves. Running a little late, he meets Wesley for his ride into town. Wesley asks, what is it in the package he is carrying? Curtain rods, Lee replies. The boarding house room that he rents, the one he sleeps in when he has not visited his wife, needs new curtain rods. He told Wesley last night that he would be collecting them this morning. And Wesley remembers now he mentions it. It closes the subject. Will she notice that he is gone for good this time? Nothing is different except the ring is in the teacup and the rifle he has taken from the garage. And those are easy things to miss. Easy because he has made them that way. No, she will not notice. Any more than Wesley will think twice about the curtain rod. They are not really looking and will not see. At work, people are busy like always. Books are logged, processed, and dispatched to schools around the state. Nobody is that excited about the motorcade, but all of them are going to watch. It makes him angry and elated. They shouldn't want to watch, but they must. Someone speaks to him. Lee, what? Give me a hand with this. The kid has too many boxes piled up on his trolley. Lee doesn't tell him to unload some of it, just helps him take the books where they need to go. It feels good to help. Time passes and opportunities open. There is a moment to get away, to unpack, to unpack the bag and put the rifle together, to prepare his spot. His vantage point gives him a perfect view of the crowd, smiling faces, waving flags. There is a strong wind, but the day is clear and he can see everything. From here he can end it all. A police motorcycle appears and the cheers get louder and it is almost time. The motorcade glides along the street in front of him, serene and not quite real. A precise moment, a 
at 12.30 p.m., he kills his man. His first shot misses. Misses everything. He's too close. He's too awkward. He fires again and he hits. His target slumps. He aims and then, again, and it's over. He sees blood and brain and relents. He drops the rifle and hurries down the stairs and when the two men stop him, he's about to buy a coke. Is this man an employee? The officer points the gun right at his head, finger on the trigger. Lee stays calm, says nothing. Yes, he is. Three short words from Lee's boss release him. The two men dash upstairs toward the past. Lee watches them go and buys his drink. Nobody stops him leaving. Outside, the street is in chaos. As he walks away from the building, Lee glances back up at the sixth floor window and expects to see himself there, firing the rifle. If it were possible to be somewhere forever, that would be his place. He rides a bus. He takes a cab. It does, it does not feel like an escape, but only an imitation of one part of a drama whose end is already set. At his boarding house, Lee changes and goes out again with a pistol jammed in his jacket pocket. The street gives a faint offer of escape. The hard sidewalk beneath his feet is somehow a shield, a protection. But soon, they find him. One of them does. The cop pulls up alongside him in the street, alone in his car, and the words that pass between them mean he has to do it again. He drags the pistol from his pocket and shoots him. Poor dumb cop, he says, and runs. A rush of images whirl around him, unknown streets and startled faces and that he, he knows see him, see his face, see it too clearly. They will know him when the police ask who it was they saw. He hurries into a movie theater where he can sit for, for hours and hope that when he leaves, the world will be different. He does not get, he, he does not get the chance. The house lights go up. Someone points him out. Well, it's all over now. He fights them. The police. For what little it's worth. He was right. It is over. Time is gone. Time is dead. What it can do to him now. He has done something. Mortal. As hard as it is to remember while they push and punch him and drag him into the street. Time has become a series of punches that can never connect with their target. At the police station, he sees a clock. It says the afternoon is getting old. Claims it will soon be night. To him, it means nothing. Questions, aggression, disbelief. Lee marches into an identity parade. They book him for murdering the policeman. Fingerprints, paraffin tests, hatred. They book him for murdering the president. The night beyond time, his brother comes to see him, a figure from a dream. Lee watches him carefully. He knows there is no bond, no common ground with this man who was once his kin 
and is now a stranger. The visitor looks into his eyes, desperate. Brother, you won't find anything there. That is how Lee tells him what he has done. It is interesting to see the reaction, the defeat in his brother's eyes. Only for, only for him have things changed. Only for any of them. For Lee, it was always like this. He goes away and Lee is alone. There is a clock on the wall, but it says nothing. It has been one day. There will be no more. For him, days and nights and time are finished. The prison around him is not as alone. 